Hello class, this is Dr. Branch. I trust you are doing well. We've finished our discussion of abortion and now we're moving to the other end of the spectrum of life and that is end of life decisions regarding the cessation of treatment or even euthanasia. So let's start with a brief survey of medical ethics, good and bad. And this is a very, very quick survey of when things have gone well and haven't gone so well. Let me begin with the Hippocratic Oath. Perhaps you've heard of this. It is not the case that every medical student has to swear the Hippocratic Oath upon graduation. Each medical school has its own traditions, but it was the defining tradition of Western medical ethics for centuries after centuries. So it predates Christianity by about four centuries. It's attributed to Hippocrates, but frankly, we're not really sure who wrote it. But what we do know is that the physicians who wrote the Hippocratic Oath were a reform movement within Greek medicine. We know this because the, the oath forbids both abortion and euthanasia, which were routinely practiced in ancient medicine. So the idea was that a Hippocratic physician was coming only to hurt and not to harm the patient. Now, you heard the phrase, first, do no harm, and this is an important principle of Hippocratic ethics, but that phrase itself is not in the Hippocratic Oath, though it is a good summary of the Hippocratic Oath. The idea that the physician comes first to help the patient and not to harm the patient. So this idea of no abortion and no euthanasia dominated Western, the Western tradition of medical ethics for centuries up until immediately following World War II. A Christian version appeared somewhere around 500 AD, but it never gained the popularity of the pagan version, which actually is dedicated to the gods Asclepius and Pangaea and Hygieia and things like that. Well, I skip forward several centuries, and we see the first major event where Hippocratic ethics were abandoned, and this occurred in Nazi Germany. Now, some ethicists do not like that I bring up Nazi Germany in discussions of medical ethics is viewed as an anomaly, but Nazi Germany is an example of what happens when medical ethics go very, very wrong. So I'll just give you some background. In the 1800s, what prepared the way for Nazi Germany was really Hegelian ethics, his dialectic eroded the idea of moral absolutes. And also during the 1800s, you have Nietzsche saying things like this in the Twilight of the Idols, quote, the invalid is a parasite on society. In a certain state, it is indecent to go on living. So trends like this prepared the way for the acceptance of widespread euthanasia in Nazi Germany. Now, what happened next was very interesting. Immediately following World War I, a book was published called The Release and Destruction of Life Devoid of Value. This book was published by Carl Binding, a lawyer, and Alfred Hacke, a physician. These two men were major influential thinkers in Germany. So immediately following World War I, the Weimar Republic is laid, uh, just laid heavy with all these war reparations out of the Treaty of Versailles. And so there's an immense depression. So in an effort to save money, these two guys wrote this book, which predates the origin of the Nazi party, and they advocated a term called Lebens und Wertes Leben, or life not worthy of living. And they said there are some people who've reached such a state in life that it's not worth living, not worth going on. And they argued for euthanizing people such as the terminally ill, mentally handicapped, or physically impaired. What I want you to understand is this predates the rise of Nazi Germany, and the request to kill physically impaired people in Germany didn't begin with the Nazis, it began with the medical and legal elite. This is a very important point to remember. Things went on until when Hitler did take power in the 1930s. In 1939, the Nazi government, with the complete complicity of medical and legal elite, started what was called the T4 Project. That reference to the address where it was headquartered, Tiergartenstrasse 4. And this was a, a project in which between 70,000 and 200,000 physically handicapped, senile, elderly, mentally handicapped Germans were, were euthanized by their government. 
and many of the same methods used to kill these weak and mentally ill people were later used on Jews in the Holocaust. The first people to be gassed were not the Jews in the Holocaust, where six million Jews were horribly butchered and killed by the Nazis. But the method of gassing people was first tried on mentally ill Germans, the T4 project. This is a picture of a crematory where ashes of people killed in the T4 project are being uh, streaming into the sky. Uh, these are buses on which the mentally ill people were taken to the killing centers. So the T4 project, the, what I want you to remember is it predated the Holocaust. It occurred with the complicity of the medical and legal elite in Germany. And in it, weak and physically ill or mentally ill Germans were killed with methods later used in the Holocaust where six million Jews were killed. Now, this around this time, because people in Germany, even during the war, are starting to question the T4 project, the Nazi government developed a movie, Ich Klage, which is a pro-euthanasia film about this pianist, the lady who has multiple sclerosis, and she's euthanized by her husband. He's taken to trial, and he's accused of euthanasia. And it's a pro-euthanasia movie. It's a strong case for what would now be called mercy killing. And a modern equivalent would be the movie Million Dollar Baby with Clint Eastwood and Morgan Freeman. So in America, there were also examples of medical experiments which rejected the fundamental principles of informed consent, most famously the Tuskegee experiments, which went on for 40 years in which black men in Alabama with syphilis were observed and denied access to a cure and they were taking place in an experiment and they didn't know it. This is a lack of informed consent and they were taken advantage of because they're of a disadvantaged class, denied certain civil rights in that era. So the most modern form of medical ethics today comes from Beecham and Childress. It's uh, the four principle approach which basically tries to balance non-maleficence, first do no harm, with beneficence, the idea that we're to act in the best interest of others, justice, and autonomy. But I will tell you what happens frequently is autonomy trumps everything else and someone's own desires or uh, self, self will, their autonomy, uh, takes, it, takes supremacy over, over all the other principles. So part of the problem that we're dealing with today when we deal with end-of-life issues is the growth of medical technologies, things our great-grandparents never imagined. Artificial respiration, here you see iron lungs, and now we use artificial respirators. But this allows the intubation and people can be kept alive with respirators. Dialysis, people would die of renal failure before the development of dialysis, uh, the alpha-sign Sitting in right now, as I'm looking out across the way from my lovely office here at Midwestern, there is a dialysis center where people stop by every day for dialysis treatment. Artificial food and hydration, you see some different ways this can be inserted through the nose or through the stomach. This will become important in a couple of legal cases that we see in just a moment. So this is changes the way we die and it changes the way we address death. People used to die at home, but now most people also survive childhood diseases. It has been several generations since we have been involved in a massive war. The last one for the United States were about 56,000 uh, KIAs in Vietnam, and though we've had several thousand die in the war in the Middle East, not nearly as many as Vietnam to date. So this has changed the way people address death. People survive childhood diseases vast majority of people don't serve in the military anymore. No one sees war. People don't die at home. We have institutionalized dying. So all this has led to a lot of changes. Now here's a few important terms. I'm not going to go over every one of these, but I want to point out some terms and just some language for you as we're addressing end-of-life issues. First thing is what is the definition of death? The most common use is, or the most commonly used definition is called the Harvard Medical School, came out in 1969. Whole brain death has several criteria that's, that someone can walk through. Some argue that you can have what's called neocortical death where the higher brain stops functioning, but typically the Harvard Medical School criteria are used. 
So here's three terms you need to know. Termination of life support, physician-assisted suicide, and euthanasia. These will be on the final. So termination of life support is generally refers to withholding medical treatment from a dying patient. So you might withdraw a respirator from someone who is dying. Physician-assisted suicide is different. Here, the physician provides the patient with the means to kill himself or herself, usually a lethal dose of an oral medication. This is what is legal in several states in the United States here, beginning with Oregon in 1997. The physician doesn't actually kill the patient. The physician gives the patient the drugs he or she can take to kill himself or herself. Euthanasia is different. In euthanasia, the physician actually kills the patient usually with a lethal dose given via injection, a lethal injection. So that's the key distinction. Physician-assisted suicide, the patient kills himself or herself using drugs provided by the physician, usually orally. But in euthanasia, the physician actually does the killing. So there's three different categories. Voluntary is when someone asks for euthanasia. Non-voluntary is when they can neither ask nor deny a request for euthanasia and someone else makes the decision for them. And involuntary actually occurs of some now in Holland where people specifically said, don't kill me, but they're euthanized anyway. So uh, I'm going to scoot past some things here. I'm say just a quick word about different legal devices, living wills, advanced directives. These are legal devices that people now put into place to try to indicate what they want to happen should they become incapacitated and are on life-sustaining technologies and at what point they would want life-sustaining technologies withdrawn or food and hydration withdrawn. A durable power of attorney for health care is basically where you assign someone else to be your decision maker for you. So let's scoot past some of these ideas and let me move on to a few two legal cases. I have four here. I'm only going to mention two. First is the case of Karen Ann Quinlan. She overdosed on alcohol and Valium at a party. And she continued to, what happened was she was being kept alive on a respirator. Her parents went through a series of appeals through the New Jersey state court systems. If you're outside the United States, this case never went outside the legal jurisdiction of New Jersey, but it set a precedent for other states. And what happened was the state of New Jersey gave permission for her family to remove the respirator. And when they did, surprisingly, she stayed alive. And it's interesting, her family were very devout Catholics. And for them, the respirator was an extraordinary means. However, the food and hydration they considered an ordinary means. And she was kept alive um, that way until 1985. The next case is a lot more complicated. I'm only going to say a couple of things about it. It originated in the state where Midwestern is located, Missouri. Nancy Cruzan, she uh, had a car accident. She never uh, regained consciousness after the car accident. And she was kept alive on artificial food and hydration for years. Her family asked to have asked a court to allow the food and hydration to be removed. Eventually, it worked its all the, the way all the way to the United States Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said that food and hydration could be removed if the person had left some uh, indication that that's what they wanted to have happen. Unfortunately, Cruzan hadn't given any instructions, so the Supreme Court said, well, but in this case, you can't remove her food and hydration. Shortly thereafter, her family found three former co-workers, I think they worked with her in Oklahoma, that gave testimony to a judge that said, hey, she said if she was ever in this uh, vegetative state, she wouldn't want to be kept alive. And eventually she um, was removed from food and hydration and she died about two weeks later, which is about how long it takes you to starve and dehydrate to death. So this seems to be the most difficult issue among evangelicals. Is it morally legitimate to cease artificial food and hydration on behalf of a non-competent patient, especially when they've left no advanced directive? So a couple of words that you uh, will encounter, especially in ministry. First is hospice. The modern day hospice movement is credited to Dame Cicely Saunders in the United Kingdom. And the idea is to try to personalize and deinstitutionalize the act of dying. Remember, because of all these machines, people used to die at home, now they die at hospitals. 
Well, the hospice movement was an attempt to personalize dying and, and make it not so sterile and institutionalized. So a word you'll often hear is palliative care, and this just means end-of-life care. How do you care for someone at the end of life and through the care help them live with a chronic illness over an extended time, cancer, life-threatening burns, Alzheimer's, all these sort of things. That's palliative care. And a palliative care team will consist of a chaplain, a social worker, counselor, nurse, physician, family, the patient. It's, it's a team that looks at what's the best for the patient. So if you are dealing with someone who is a long-term condition in the hospital, you may have a palliative care team. And you may actually, as a pastor, be invited to be part of that. Hospice is care designed for those that are dying. And it requires two physicians' written statements anticipating death within six months. Uh, my wife works at a hospital that actually has a hospice attached to the healthcare system. It started out as a volunteer-led movement uh, to provide compassion, to provide compassionate uh, care for the dying. And it's a significant part of our national health care. It's covered by Medicare. That should be capitalized, Medicare. So about 80% of hospice patients are taken care of at home. So what we're looking at here is some of the shifts that have taken place because of changes in ethics. Remember, a major shift from the Hippocratic idea of first do no harm to a very self-centered, autonomy-driven approach. And out of autonomy-driven ethics, people basically view the physician as a provider of a service, and they come and say, I want to die, you have the means to help me die, and I'm expecting you to give me what I want regardless of your own medical concerns. And then also the degree to which people, we have institutionalized dying, and the hospice movement is an attempt to bring that to a more personal level and to take away some of the sterileness and the, the institutional nature of dying.